and then it there you go how easy was that so why didn't you have it that's really strange it's okay. the first time that's ever happened all right well everyone let's uh open our our bible study and prayer heavenly father we praise and thank you for this time that we can gather around uh and virtually be together and uh feed on your word study your word lord we thank you that it truly is a lamp to our feet a light to our path it is our food it is our counselor it is our comforter and it is a, a light shining in a dark place and we thank you that heaven and earth will pass away but your words will never pass away and we thank you and praise you for it bless our time in the name of you you are our savior amen Oh, man. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Good to be with you. Good to see you all. And um, we are studying the passage. Um, let me just uh, put a mute here. Oh, this is the first time I can mute everyone. That's wonderful. The power. <laughs> do that. Uh, Don't let it go to your head, Aharon. I know, if you I have know. a participants button at the bottom, yes, here we go. Hit that, okay. and all the people will come up on the right, and then you'll see the microphone. It should well, say twenty one participants. Uh, okay, so I'm pressing participants. Just click it. Yeah, it do doesn't. Nothing comes up. You don't have the people on the right, huh? Well, maybe I could just ask if everyone could please. Um, uh, mute, mute yourself <laughs> thank you okay well everyone uh i've called this uh bible study today um okay. some of you some of you are not muted so i'll say it again please can you mute yourselves thank you um i've called this bible study uh the god of reconciliation and healing and that is a really important theme in Israel today, but in any aspect of our lives, that is probably one of the, the, the real hearts or rather a, a very important place in God's heart, reconciliation and healing. I'm going to try and get the mute because not everyone has muted. I'm going to uh, reclaim the host and mute people. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, uh, God's heart is very much for reconciliation, as is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in the Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for the Messiah, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, and Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God. So there it's very clear that um, God has reconciled the world through the Messiah, and he's given us that same ministry. But there is a, a little catch to that. Not everyone wants reconciliation. And sometimes we may make steps, but people aren't interested, as is mentioned in Romans 12, 18. It says, Paul says to the church of Rome, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. And that that uh, passage is, is done twice there. So forget that uh, rest of the reading. But that verse says, as much as is it in you, 
you do your part to live peaceably with all men. So um, we know, um, here's the thing, when we're making steps towards reconciliation and peace, sometimes we need to be brave and bold. It's not easy, especially if you've got, if there's bad blood and uh, you, you need to take that step. You know, the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty, we're at the top of page three. Um, and that leads me to what's been going on in the last week. The negotiations that we've been having as a nation with our enemies. Now, it's not exactly reconciliation, but it is uh, 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 it was negotiation over something. And we all know what that was. That was over our captives. And um, there was a huge amount of debate. Should we? Should we not? We ended up giving a ratio three to one, three, three. And by the way, even though it was three to one, it was more than that because the ones that we were getting back, they were poor, innocent children, teenagers, grandmothers, and we were releasing cold-blooded, uh, uh, well, they weren't murderers, but anyone that goes out to murder, um, that's why they're in prison because it, they, they may not have succeeded, but that was their plan. So um, it's not exactly three to one. It was more than three to one. It was dangerous people that we've let out on the street. So we had to go through a negotiation process. None of us really know exactly how that went because it was the government. It was at the government level. One criticism over those negotiations, everyone, is that we allowed the Americans, no disrespect to you Americans, we allowed the Americans to be involved with it, number one. And number two, we actually allowed the families of the abductees to sit in on the meetings. This is the first time that we've done this. And there was a, a lot of criticism against it. I think, you know, when you start to hear their emotions and their pain and everything, obviously it's going to uh, make an influence. So, um, but anyway, it's done. We, there was a ceasefire. We all know that Hamas was reloading, replanning. It's over now. It was broken about a quarter of an hour before it officially was to be broken. The war is back on. But let me tell you, guys, this is a mess. It's not just Gaza. It's the northern border with Lebanon. On the eastern border, the Jordanian soldiers have rallied themselves under the uh, orders of King Abdullah. But the real concern that is coming out in the last couple of days is what's happening in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. Apparently, it's ready to explode. It is, they're, they're just a lot of people from Hamas inside. And we need prayer, we need watchmen, we need our military. And uh, um, since the war broke out, there's been about two and a half thousand that have been um, uh, arrested and a number that have been uh, taken out. So it's a hotbed ready to explode. So, and not on, and, and on top of that, of course, we have the media uh, front where we are just, it doesn't matter what we do, um, you know, we are under attack. However, we have got people like Douglas Murray that I mentioned, Amir Safati going to the Congress. We have good voices out there. Um, and of course, now we're seeing some changes. Look what happened in Holland. The ultra right winger who was uh, cast off for years as a radical, he has just been voted into the parliament in Holland, and he wants to ban the Quran, and uh, he is totally against uh, allowing the Muslims uh, in and being a voice. Uh, of course, he, you know, for years he's been called a, a, a radical, but people are waking up. Thank God they're waking up, and other places, Argentina, other places in Europe as well. So um, things are happening. Now, we're going to go to the, the text. That's just as a little bit of a platform, because today there is a story of negotiation and reconciliation where Jacob 
is about to be reconciled with his brother Esau. But don't forget, there's a lot of bad blood between them. And whose fault is that? It was Jacob's fault. Okay, we gotta we gotta put our hands up when it's our fault. And in this case, it was Jacob's fault. Jacob could have blamed his mother for telling him to dress up in the hairy arms. But uh, remember last week when Jacob was all alone in the wilderness and uh, uh, God appeared to him, but probably in that wilderness place where he was forced to, to flee because Esau, his brother, when he heard that had been ripped off, wanted to kill him. So Rebecca, the mother, told Jacob to get out, go to my brother's Laban, Laban. He went, but then he, he had troubles there everywhere he went. So he was out in the wilderness and um, probably he started to think about the dust that had left behind him. So many years uh, fast forward to Genesis 32 verse 4. Uh, Jacob knows that his brother is alive. So it says in uh, chapter four, uh, sorry, chapter 32, verse four, and Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the field of Edom. That's on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. And, and in the Hebrew, it's Vayishlach, and he sent these messengers, okay? And uh, that's the name of our parasha, he sent. He was taking some uh, action. Jacob was planning everything on his terms. All seemed good. Let's read. Um, I put in the notes, Gen yes, Genesis 32, verse 3. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are saying to my Lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there until now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. Okay. The ball is in Jacob's court, but he's serving that ball into Esau's court because he knows that many years before Esau wanted to kill him because twice, once Esau sold his birthright and se the second time um, uh, Jacob deceived his father. So what was the response from Esau? Now, before we go there, Jacob doesn't have a clue what's around the corner. And this is what I was talking about before. When it comes to being reconciled, when it comes to mending relationships, we don't know what's around the corner. And it's scary. We don't know what kind of response people are going to throw at us. Um, and Jacob certainly didn't know. But look what happens in Genesis 32, 6. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. That is not good news. In, and look at Jacob's response. Verse 7. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups. And the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. He thought. If Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. So this is what Jacob's doing. He obviously realizes that Jacob is going to kill him and possibly his family. So he splits his family up in case one group gets killed. The, the other will continue his name. Okay, Don't forget everyone. Oh, Actually, let's, let's see what happens next. Now we come to verse 9, and this is actually the first prayer that we know of in Jacob's life. Up until now, we don't really, um, well, actually, last week at Bethel, he kind of offered a prayer where he, you know, he said, God, if you're 
uh, if you bring me back home and you uh, 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 give me food to eat and a place to, to sleep, then everything I have, I will give you 10%. Okay, and I, I, I think I've told you before, you know, Jacob was the, the perfect Jewish businessman. He was basically saying, God, you give me 100 and I'll give you 10%. I mean, what a great deal. So, but here Jacob offers up a prayer, verse nine, then Jacob prayed. Remember, 400 men along with Esau are on their way. Jacob prayed, oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I'll make you prosper. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So Jacob here, he's obviously looking at the situation but now he's bringing God's word into the arena. So God's word is in the heavenlies. God's word is in the spiritual realm. God's word is not being fulfilled right now in Jacob's life. He's going by his natural eye and it doesn't look good. Questions. Guys, Jacob right now, is he with his prayer? with his reconciliation with his brother Esau. What is, what's going on in Jacob? Probably Jacob doesn't even realize, but what's right down in his soul? Is he guilty? Does he feel guilt? Because remember, he knows what he did to his brother. And what he's about to do with this reconciliation, is it out of guilt? Is it out of penance? Is it out of a bit of both? What is really motivating them here? Is he just wanna, does he just want to save his life? Is he really sorry for what he did to his brother? Chapter 32, verse 13. He spent the night there. And from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, not a bad uh, gift. 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. Wow, that is a lot. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. So verse 17, he commanded the foremost saying, when Esau, my brother comes and meets you and asks saying, what are these? And where do you go? And whose are these before these? Then you shall say, they be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my Lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. And so commanded he the second and the third and all that followed the drove saying, on this manner shall you speak unto Esau when you find him. So Jacob has really planned this very good. And it really seems that there's a purity to this. It really seems like a genuine, he really wants, I mean, look at the gift that he's offering his brother. So before Esau arrives, something happens, everyone. Look at verse 22. Jacob, and he arose that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the ford Jabok. Now, let me say the word Jabok in Hebrew is Yabok. And you know what it means? It me, it's actually from the same root word as this, a bottle. In Hebrew, the word bottle is bakbuk. And this is the yabok, book 
yabok, bakbok, it's the same root word. And actually, if you pour out water, the actual noise that it makes, bok, 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 bok. So it's a play on words. And the jabok or the yabok literally means to be emptied out. And this is what's going to happen with Jacob. Look at verse 23. When he comes to the yabok, and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And then verse 24. And Yaakov, Jacob, was left all alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Two things. Number one, he was all alone. And number two, he wrestled all night. Verse 27. He said to him, now this, this person, let me just say, who was this person wrestling with Jacob? In the English and in the Hebrew, it's the word ish, which means a man. Okay? It was a man that wrestled with him. That's all it says, an ish. In Hosea chapter 14, there's a little commentary that Hosea gives on it, and it says, he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. In the Hebrew mindset, the angel of the Lord means a messenger from the Lord. You and I can actually be the angel of the Lord in the sense that we can be a messenger. In fact, the prophet Malachi, that means the messenger, Malachi. Malach means messenger or angel. And, and, and Malachi was the messenger. Okay? But... A lot of times in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord actually is the Lord himself. Okay? So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you and I are on the same level of, of the Lord. I'm saying we can be used as a messenger of the Lord. Um, but in this text, it was just a man wrestled with him. And this man said in verse 27, what is thy name? Now, what does that remind you of, everyone? What is thy name? Do you remember many years before when Jacob deceived his father, Isaac? Remember what Isaac said? He said, who are you? Which is, in, a, in a way is saying, what is your name? And Jacob deceived his father and said, I am Esau. So it could well be that this man and this whole testing of Jacob to see where he was at was bringing back that memory. Who are you? What is your name? And of course, he said, Jacob. So now he's being honest. And look what the response was in verse 28. And he said, thy name shall be no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Now, most commentators would say, that Yaakov, Jacob, means a supplanter or a heel grabber from the word ekev, which means a heel, but a trickster. The name Israel has a couple of different uh, interpretations. One is Yishael, one who walks straight with God, or Yisar. El, you will be a prince, Sar, with God. So uh, this is not just a, a name change. This is, we've talked about this many times, a name stood for your, not only character, but your destiny. This was to do with his calling and his destiny. So in Go back a couple of verses to verse 26. Jacob's, uh, 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 Jacob said, uh, I'm sorry, the man said, let me go for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And then verse 29, look what it says. He blessed him there. He blessed him. So ladies and gentlemen, the question is, what was the blessing? Where it says he blessed him. What was this blessing? 
Was it his name change, his character change, his destiny? I think what it could be is if we read on verse 29 and 30, Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Guys, that's what I think was the blessing. Jacob had a new experience with the Lord. He had this encounter with the living God. Yes, he touched his hip. Yes, he kept things back from him. But I think the sense of Jacob asking, what is your name? He wanted to know. He wanted this knowledge. Now, this sense of knowledge, everyone, this is the, and remember what I said before, he wrestled all night until the breaking of the day. Now, I remember when I was in the uh, IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, we had to do shifts of guard duty. The worst shift was from midnight until six in the morning. The first couple of hours was okay. But I'm telling you that from, say, two to five in the morning, it just got darker. It just got colder. And you got tired. And you just were waiting for the daybreak. And it just it dragged on and on and on. And when you saw that first glimmer of daybreak, it was like heavenly. So Jacob wrestled this all night wrestle, but he didn't let him go. And see, this shows us that Jacob was serious. He said, I won't let you go until you bless me. He was asking the man his name. Guys, I think what that is, is that he, the this, uh, this sense of he wanted to know intimately who this man was. And of course, he, I believe deep down, he knew that there was something heavenly about this man. And uh, so this, the sense of knowing, you know, where it says in the scriptures, Adam knew Eve, this deep, intimate knowing. And if you do a study right through the scriptures, there's a deep theme about seeking God. God invites us, seek me and live. Those who seek me shall find me. And uh, in John 4, it, it, the Lord said to the woman of Samaria, uh, God is spirit and uh, the Father is seeking those who will seek after him. So Jacob's response in verse 32. Oh, and by the way, let me just uh, finally just, just cap off when I say what was the blessing, where it says God blessed him there. He got a blessing, something from God. He was able to see something of the character of God. He saw God's face. Now, in the Bible, face, panim, I personally don't believe that God has a face. I don't believe he has a back. I don't believe he has hands, and I don't believe he has a feet. Of course, Yeshua, Jesus, and the flesh, I'm not talking about the incarnation. But when the writers were writing about this God who is spirit, they had to try and use human terms to express something about him. So when they use the term, the right hand of God, that was symbolic of the day and the culture where kings had a special place and it was at their right hand. It was a place of honor and royalty. Okay, The right hand also spoke of strength. Um, so the face of God is symbolic of his presence, of his manifold characteristics. The, In fact, in Exodus 33, 
when Moses said, I will not go unless your presence goes with me. And the Lord said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In the Hebrew, presence is my faces. My faces will go with you. That's Exodus 33. I think it's verse 15. And uh, my faces will go with, with you. What does it mean? My faces will go with you. Well, firstly, in the Hebrew, face is never singular. It's always plural. My face is my, my presence, my, uh, my gaze, my heart. I don't know. We, this is where we have to interpret it. We've said before, there are, there are shivim panim. There's many different ways of interpreting uh, that. But uh, the point is, is Jacob, he, he, was, he saw something into the heart, into the face of God, and he was able to live through it. And this was the blessing. That was enough for him. That was part of his transformation, part of his growth. And um, so what does he do in response? Verse 32, there, therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Jacob built a memorial and he went off with a limp. Uh, I don't know who that is. But, uh, yeah, um, it's really interesting. Until today, everyone, traditionally Jewish people do not eat the, that part of the uh, the tendon. <coughs> In fact, since that tendon is kind of tricky to cut out of the hindquarter, most kosher butchering operations typically just sell the entire hindquarter of kosher animals to a non-kosher producer and simply not bother with the removal process. In fact, there was an ancient Jewish community in Kaifeng in China it is said that the local Chinese name for this community was pick out the tendons because the Chinese had noticed them following this rule. That's just a little bit of uh, inf uh, information. But guys, Jacob has just had the wrestle of his life and he wakes up in the morning. He's a transformed man. He's got a bit of a limp. Uh, he uh, he realizes that this was not just a normal man because he names the place Peniel. So, uh, guys, the question is, who is a man? Because it says he wrestled with an ish. And who is God? He saw the face of God and lived. So this is a really good passage to use. Um, I believe that this could well be Yeshua uh, before his incarnation, the messenger of the Lord, mentioned in, in Hosea chapter 14. Anyway, we're up to now the reconciliation. Genesis 33, verse 33. Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. He, he is now really humiliating himself or humbling himself. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. They wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and the children. Who are these with you? He asked. Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. This was Jacob's nephews and, and relatives. Esau asked, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds? that I meant to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. 
For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me favorably, please accept the present that was brought to you. For God has been gracious to me and I have all that I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. What an amazing scene of reconciliation and healing. The bad blood between these brothers. But guys, it took guts from Jacob to step out and do it. This is the hard part. This is the challenging part. We read about it. We think it was just, it just happened. No, it didn't just happen. Jacob had to plan it. The same Jacob that's, that, that deceived and 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 uh, plotted for, for for negative, now he is a Yeshael, an Israel, walking straight with God. So, um, and and I'm I'm quoting to you Hosea's uh, account of it. I actually quoted Hosea 14. I was wrong. It's Hosea 12. This is what he says about it. The Lord has a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings, will he recompense him? He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the messenger, angel, and he prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even the Lord of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Therefore turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. Notice verse four. When he's recounting from the past, he goes into the present and says, there he spoke with us. So this is a message, guys, for us. It happened then, but it is for us. Now, we're going to leave that theme and we're going to open it up when it comes to uh, our question and answer and discussing it later on. But I want us to now go into the next chapter, which is a very sensitive story. And it's a very uh, kind of applicable story for our days. It's the story of Jacob's daughter. Most of us don't even know that Jacob had a daughter. We all know that he had his 12 sons, but he, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, this is, this is fast forwarding. Uh, this is uh, uh, Jacob's daughter called Dina or Dinah. In Hebrew, we say Dina. And in verse, chapter 34, four, verse 5, um, <clears throat> uh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead. Verse, chapter In the middle of page nine, that's wrong. It should, I think it should be verse two, verse one or two. Chapter 34, verse one or two, it says, Now Dina, the door, it's verse one, the daughter Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. Now, let's just pause for a second. That verse says, She went out. Now, there's a lot of question about that verse was she right to just go out it doesn't say she asked permission it doesn't say that there was any danger but knowing what's about to happen some people are question whether that was wise for her in those days it's like when i take groups and we stay in certain places in Jerusalem, I say to them, girls, do not go out in this area by yourself at night. If you're going to go out, make sure it's least in two or threes or with a man. By the way, about, uh, I think it was about a year ago, um, there was, I, I did that. And, and there was a, a couple of girls on my bus. They were a bit butch. And they came up to me and they were a little offended by me saying that. They said, Aaron, we were offended. And I said, what? Well, what did I say? And they said, well, how would you feel if we were living in America? And I made an announcement. Men, don't go out at night unless a woman is with you. That was what they said. And I'm kind of like, oh, gosh. So I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't go there. 
but anyway that's that's kind of the the uh some women they they don't like to be looked down upon or looked upon as weaker um anyhow uh the question is is was she wise to go out verse two when shechem son of hamor the hivite the ruler of that area saw her he took her and raped her his heart was drawn to dina daughter of jacob he loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her as shechem said to his father hamor get me this girl as my wife Oh, okay, so that's how you love someone, right? You rape her. It's crazy. The, the, the narrative is really bizarre. It starts off by saying he raped her. Then it says, oh, by the way, he loved her and he wanted her. So he says to the father, go and get her for me. So I maybe there's something I'm missing here. Maybe there's something in the culture of the day. I don't know. Maybe this was so patriarchal that men just did what they wanted and they took what they wanted uh when they wanted so verse five says when jacob heard that his daughter dina had been defiled his sons were in the fields with his livestock so he did nothing about it until they came home now, question, you're Jacob, you're in the field, you've just heard news that your daughter has been raped, defiled. Your sons, they're out in the field with the livestock, and you're Jacob, and it says he did nothing. And my question, we're going to discuss this, why did he do nothing why did he wait for the sons to come in from the field we'll we'll pick up on that in a minute verse six then shechem's father hamor went out to talk with jacob notice it says he went out to talk with jacob but look what happened meanwhile jacob's sons had come in from the fields as soon as they heard what had happened they were shocked and furious because Shechem had done an outrageous thing in Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, a thing that should not be done. And I've included the Hebrew there, and it is very strong. Hanashim. <speaking in Hebrew> It was not done something like that. So you got the picture, everyone? I'll, I'll go over it again. Jacob, when he heard about it, he didn't do anything. He waited for his sons to come. While his sons were coming, Shechem's father, Hamor, went to Jacob. But in the meantime, the sons, they arrive and they are furious. Look at verse 11. Then Shechem said to Dinah, now, now Shechem, the man who raped. This is not the father of Shechem. This is Shechem, the man who raped him. Said to Dinah's father, Notice, notice it doesn't mention his name, Jacob. It says Dina's father. That was Jacob. But his name gets left out here. Then Shechem said to Dina's father and brothers. You notice how Jacob, he's the father. He should be the main character here. But now the bro, he, he, it's, it's, it's the, the father and the brothers on the same level here. Shechem said to Dina's father and brothers, let me find favor in your eyes. You don't talk to the brothers. You don't ask the brothers. You ask the father. Let me find favor in your eyes and I will give you whatever you ask. Make the price for the bride and the gift I am to bring as great as you like. And I'll pay whatever you ask me. Only give me the young woman as my wife. So this is startling that he doesn't address the father. Because the culture, just like today's culture, 
You want to marry someone, you ask the father. So we'll get to possible reasons why very soon. Verse 13, because they're, now notice the sons, they take the lead here. Because their sister Dina had been defiled, Jacob's sons repl replied deceitfully as they spoke to Shechem and his father Hamor. So the question, where was Jacob, everyone? Well, we'll get there in a second. Verse 14, they said to him, them, we can't do such a thing. We can't give our sister to a man who is not circumcised. That would be a disgrace to us. We will enter into an agreement with you on one condition only, that you become like us by circumcising all your males. Then we will give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves. We'll settle among you and become one people with you. But if you will not agree to be circumcised, we'll take our sister and go. Look at verse 18. Their proposal seemed good to Hamor and his son Shechem. So verse 24, all the men went out of the city gate, agreed with Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male in the city was circumcised. Three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Shimon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They put Hamor, Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword and took Dina from Shechem's house and left. The sons of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and looted the city where their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and donkeys and everything else of theirs in the city and out of the fields. They carried off all their wealth and all their women and children, taking as plunder everything in their houses. Question, everyone. Was their response proportionate or disproportionate? Very interesting. In some ways, they were so angry and uh, upset about this that they had to go not only kill them, but plunder. This was part almost of the healing, the sense of retribution. We'll get there a little bit deeper very soon. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Jacob finally speaks. Verse 30. Then Jacob said to Shimon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me obnoxious to the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the people living in this land. We are few in number, and if they join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. Guys, Jacob is angry with his sons. Wouldn't you think that he should be, I don't know if proud is the word, but the fact that they were defending the honor of Dina. Dina right now is going to suffer for the rest of her life because a woman that's been raped doesn't have much hope for a future in the culture of that day. So the sons are honoring her by doing this, honoring her name. And yet Jacob is angry. Why is he angry? Is it just out of fear that the people of Canaan are, may, may retaliate? Or is there something deeper? And look at the look at Simon, Simeon and Le, Levi's response. They replied in verse thirty one. Shouldn't should he have treated our sister like a prostitute? This was a sense of a righteous anger. And of course, guys, there's been debate for centuries who was right and wrong in their response. Was Jacob right? in getting angry with his sons? Were the sons right in doing what they did? In, in, on, in your notes on page 12, I wrote a few thoughts. Jacob lived in tension. And this is going back before the story. Jacob's life was a life of tension, in concealment and in flight. 
a lot of the stories in his life revolve around the nighttime, Bethel, wrestling, doing things in secret. He conceals things from his blind father under animal skins and things are concealed from him. He stumbles on a hidden gateway to heaven and fights a mysterious man not knowing his name. He has occupied his whole life with efforts to retain Esau's blessing. He overcomes his demons, yet gains a limp, a blemish. With all this seemingly behind him, he arrives at the story at Shechem, unblemished, whole, Israel. But then he experiences headfirst the rape of his daughter, Dina. The rape of Dina and pillaging of Shechem is a difficult story with an unclear ending. Was Jacob right to criticize Simeon and Levi, or were they right to defend their sister's honor? Later on in Jacob's life, when he blesses his 12 sons, look at the blessing he gives on these two sons. Simeon and Levi are br brothers. Instruments of cruelty are, are they in their habitations. My soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Friends, maybe Jacob was actually taking out his anger on his sons, because deep down, maybe Jacob knew that perhaps he was responsible. I'll say that again. Maybe deep down, Jacob felt guilty because he should have been watching out for his daughter. She went out. That was the beginning in verse one. Jacob was the father. He was responsible. Now, maybe she went out without telling him and irresponsibly, or maybe Jacob just wasn't around. And maybe he was angry at himself and at what happened, and he's putting, <coughs> putting that anger <coughs> on his sons. That's one way of interpreting it. But their question which was a rhetorical question, shall our sister be made a whore? Lingers powerfully asserting that the brothers may have been right. This is a story of rape, power, and violence, and much ink has been spilled in trying to understand or justify the action of Dina's brothers in response. Many modern writers have noted that in focusing on the brothers' reaction to Dina's rape, Rather than on her own experience and reaction, we perpetuate the silence enveloping Dina because she doesn't say anything in the story. She is taken against her will. Her brothers negotiate about her and defend her, yet we don't hear from Dina herself. Although some modern writers have tried to reconstruct her experience, they face a genuine challenge in doing so. It might be possible to find a window into Dina's experiences uh, through another largely silent character in the story, naming her, namely her father, Jacob. Perhaps they, and this is the point, guys, that I want to bring out. Perhaps they were both in such trauma, they were unable to respond. And I think this story is so applicable to what is going on in our nation today. Because I look at Benjamin Netanyahu, I look at our defense minister, I look at our chief of staff, I actually think they're in trauma. I think Bibi is in trauma. I think deep down, Bibi, he knows at the end of the day, the, the buck stops with him. One top military leader said, when the war is over, that will be my last day serving in my position. He will step down. So the trauma that, the, or rather, 
perhaps everyone this is the reason why jacob was so silent that when he turned up and he heard what happened to his daughter that he was just in a state of trauma and when hamor the father of shechem came to talk to jacob the sons they took over they did all the negotiating jacob was in the background he was traumatized but the brothers also i believe to some degree were also traumatized and perhaps out of their trauma they reacted in the way that they did although deep down i think there is a righteousness in doing what they did there is a righteous anger and there's room and there's place for a righteous anger and in fact the lord sometimes told the israelites to go and destroy the enemy and god is righteous so you can't say it was an unrighteous thing if God is commanding the Israelites to go and defeat the enemy. Reading on the middle of page 13, although Jacob does play a role in the story, he is mostly passive. At every stage, Jacob seems to be present, but silent. Jacob's silent here can be contrasted with his strong reactions to another event. In chapter 37, later on, describes his response upon identifying Joseph's bloody coat. Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, observed mourning for his son many days. All his sons and daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, saying, no, I will go down mourning to my son in Sheol. Thus his father bewailed him. Yet the same Jacob who is distraught when his son Joseph is supposedly killed and silent when his daughter, Dina, is kidnapped, degraded, and defiled. Quite a contrast. Jacob's silence has been read in different ways. Number one, his silence when he first found out that his daughter had been raped could have been a delaying tactic, allowing his sons to return to help. Number one. Number two, it could have been a sign as the mark of a wise man in the face of the wicked. Or number three, perhaps it was a combination of both of these factors. Jacob understood that rushing out to fight could not help since Dina had already been defiled. Still, Jacob's passivity and silence remain puzzling. Why does the Torah not share with us Jacob's feelings? or plans. Nothing about his feelings, right? There's no sense that Jacob is upset or angry. That, to me, is a sign that he's in shock. He's in trauma. Why did he not negotiate himself, instead allowing his sons to do so in his place? The questions of Jacob's passivity also ties in to how Jacob strongly responds to the massacre perpetrated by his sons. He says, you have brought trouble on me, making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My men are few in number, so that if they unite against me and attack me, I and my house will be destroyed. Perhaps part of the answer to these questions lies in reading Jacob as a secondary victim. Others have assumed that the traumatic nature of the rape affected Dina and would have led to her fate as a silenced rape victim. As Caroline Blythe, who is a, uh, I think she's a clinical psychologist, writes, by being denied the opportunity to share her experiences with her family and community, by being faced only with social disgrace, devaluation, and shame, Dina suffers perpetually the fate of the silenced rape victim, isolated, stigmatized, and deprived of a supportive audience. <coughs> Whether her exclusion from the story is related to this, we cannot know. However, Jacob's silence is pronounced because it takes place in the narrative and it suggests that it stems from secondary trauma. One significant element of trauma is the silence surrounding it. Judith Herman writes in the introduction to her classic study, Trauma and Recovery, that the ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness certain violations of the social compact are too terrible to utter aloud this is the meaning of the word 
unspeakable. People push down and bury these traumatic experiences. At times, the silence surrounding rape is even more difficult because the event often takes place in private in a way that protects the perpetrator and can lead the victim to blame or question themselves. By the way, everyone, there are terrible stories uh, emulating from some of the children that have been released from captivity. Some terrible stories that they were so traumatized, it, the way they were treated by the Hamas terrorists, being told that they can only whisper. And uh, it hasn't really been uh, uh, relayed to the public. Just little little stories here and there, but it was it was abuse, and uh, time will uh, expose more. But they are going to need a lot of love, a lot of special care, and even the way that um, psychologists plan when the children were to be brought back, there were to be certain steps that if the children ask, "Is my mother or um, is my father alive?" The, the people that were receiving them were not to give any answers. It was all planned as carefully and as healing as possible. Uh, but at the top of page 15, in traumatic events, and particularly rape, there can also be secondary victim, Israeli soldiers and soldiers. Example, let me give you an example of secondary victims, everyone. About, I don't know, a year, a year and a half ago, I led a, a small private group, a group actually from South Africa. And um, on the last day of the tour, the leader, uh, a, 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 a lady, she says to me, hey, Aaron, I'd love to share my testimony before uh, we go to the airport. So we sat out and we were having breakfast. And she told me that in South Africa, a lot of people grow up with servants in the house. And she and her family had a servant who had been their, their family servant for 30 years. Well, one day that servant betrayed her and her family. She told her son where all the money and everything was hidden in the house. And while this girl who was... This lady was telling me her testimony. She told me that I was at home one night with with a group of my friends. We were having a um, kind of like a, a little party. And I think she said there were about eight of us. And the son of the servant, along with a gang of his friends, came over. And she told me uh, from uh, night until morning, they repeatedly raped us. And, uh, and I'm sitting there listening to the story and I could hardly believe my ears. I think the main reason why I couldn't believe it is because this lady, she did not seem to be like a, a victim, someone whose life was destroyed. And I'm, but I'm in shock listening uh, to the story. Uh, maybe I was a little bit traumatized by the story as well. <clears throat> what hit me in the story is when she said this, because I said to her, I said, how did you get through? How did you work through this? How did you, the betrayal, the rape, everything. And she, her response was this. She said, she said, all I can say is God gave me so much grace to be able to work through it. She said, the only area where I still uh, suffer is when I go to bed at night uh, I suffer severe uh, fear and anxiety that maybe something will happen uh, during the night. But then she said, actually, when my sister, who was sitting in the room listening in the conversation, when my sister and my parents, I think, when they all heard about it, they were the ones who actually found it even harder than I found it. Their, her family were traumatized by what happened to her. And so this was a great example, I think, of what this uh, clinical psychologist is calling secondary trauma. You and I may hear of, of a story of someone that we know 
Um, and it may hit us. It may hit us to a level that we don't even realize that we're traumatized by it. So um, if I could carry on reading from page 15, researchers know that following a sexual assault, family and friends may experience emotional distress, including shock, helplessness, and rage, which can parallel the response of the victim. Notice I'll say that again. It can parallel the response of the victim. Guys, if if someone here is listening or someone is listening on the recording and you've had something like this uh, happen to you or you know someone who this has happened to or in the future you're going to be helping someone, the, these are key or these are keys and these are tools to help us understand people that are dealing with trauma. They too may feel violated, guilty, and I'm talking about the secondary people, the families or the close friends. They too may feel violated, guilty, devalued, and may engage in self-blame. As Herman chillingly formulates, witnesses as well as victims are subject to the dialectic of trauma. It is even more difficult to find a language that conveys fully and persuasively what one has seen. Those who attempt to describe the atrocities that they have witnessed also risk their own credibility. To speak publicly about one's knowledge of atrocities is to invite the stigma that attaches to victims. Guys, that's like what's happening today when people have the guts to talk about what Hamas have done. <coughs> have you heard some people's responses? That never happened. <coughs> You're just exaggerating numbers. Let alone what happened in the Holocaust. People are saying what happened two months ago didn't happen or the numbers are being exaggerated. Jacob has no power, no ability to act and few options. When Joseph is supposedly taken by a wild animal, there is no stigma at play. And so he is free to mourn publicly. But in this case, Jacob does not say anything because he has undergone the trauma of having his daughter raped and kidnapped. He is powerless to stop what is going on. A shepherd in a field he brought from the Hittites, his daughter in their palace, his sons away from home. In many ways, Jacob mirrors Dina. His silence is also her silence. As his sons negotiate on Dina's behalf, they are also negotiate, negotiating for Jacob. Perhaps like Dina, Jacob is shocked into silence by the violence committed against his daughter. The story in Genesis 34 ends with Dina's silence and with Jacob's, a silence which too often accompanies the victims of violent crimes and their families. As research has shown, secondary victims may experience feelings similar to the direct victim including feelings of guilt, devaluation, and anger. The shock of a father who questions whether he was to blame, who feels guilty over his inability to act, who may want to act and negotiate on behalf of Dina, but is simply unable to do so. So, so guys, who is to blame? Just as some traditions blame Dina for going out, others blame Jacob, either for not fulfilling his Val, or for his overcautious treatment of Dina when meeting Esau. Perhaps Jacob and Dina had thoughts of self-blame as they are roiled by the concern that each of them did not do enough to prevent this horrible event from occurring. Although Dina's voice is not heard in the narrative, Jacob's silence is evidence of his trauma and may also offer a window into, window into Dina's pain. Perhaps trying to understand Jacob and by extension, Dina, can be a starting point which begins to break the silence. So, guys, I know that was heavy, but it's. I'm sure, I hope, I hope it's given us all something to think about when we think of cases in our own lives, friends, family. When we look back and we question our own responsibilities, our own reactions, our own responses. What did we take upon board? How did we take things on board? And maybe we carry guilt because of things we could have, should have, 
done. But moving on, and I'm going to come to a conclusion very soon, because Jacob, amazingly, that's not the end for Jacob. It, it almost seems that it's the end for Dina. There's nothing more about Dina here in the narrative, in the scriptures. But Jacob is moving on. Jacob has a call. Jacob is now Israel. And so God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all those who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on all the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother in response, in, sorry, in the top of page 17, in Genesis 28, Jacob built a stone and called it Bethel. It was in response to the dream that we talked about last week. But now in Genesis 35, God called Jacob to go to Bethel a second time and build him an altar there. This time, Jacob came to Bethel not merely in a dream, but in reality, his experience was deeper. In other words, everyone, the first time at Bethel, he, he had a dream. Now, God commanded him to go back. Now it was in reality. God told him to go back where he had made his vow to God. Presently, Jacob wasn't fulfilling that vow. He was wandering. He was dwelling in shelters, building shelters, but he must go back to Bethel and keep his part of the vow. And then in chapter 35, verse 16, then they moved on from Bethel while they were still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. By the way, this is the Rachel that Jacob loved passionately and served 14 years for. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't despair for you have another son. And as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephra, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Today, right by Bethlehem, there is Rachel's tomb. But I love the end of the story for, for this week, everyone, that when his beloved Rachel was giving birth, Jacob changed the name of his son that, uh, that uh, Rachel called him Ben-Oni. Ben-Oni, everyone, you know what that means? It means son of my trouble. But Jacob refused to see Benjamin as the son of my trouble. Instead, he called him Benjamin seated at the right hand. And in other words, uh, even though the birth cost the life of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel, Instead, he saw his son as one who would always have a place of honor in the family. Now, he could have been traumatized by the death of his wife, but instead, he acted in response. He moved forward and uh, he became proactive. So, guys, <clears throat> to end, to conclude our study, The Lord is with us in our troubles. The Lord, he, Yeshua, 
he is, in a way, he is Ben-Oni, the son of troubles. He was a man of sorrows. He was the one who suffered as a man for us. But because he was faithful, God the Father exalted him. And now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is the Benjamin. He is seated. That's what Benjamin means, seated at the right hand. This was prophesied in Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook on the way. Therefore shall he lift up his head. Guys, that is our Messiah. And our Messiah, who lives with us and lives in us, he, ha <clears throat> he has a ministry of reconciliation. He has reconciled us and given us that ministry. He's with us in our troubles. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up the wounds. He sets the captives free. He gives liberty to the captives. He makes us his sons and daughters seated with him. And he can make us, he can transform us from being sons of trouble to becoming seated with him in the heavenly places in Yeshua HaMashiach. And guys, if there's any of you that are facing similar traumas, open your hearts and let the Holy Spirit do a deep healing in your life. And let me finish by saying that lady from South Africa who I shared her testimony, I'm not mentioning her name. You know what she said to me? Living in South Africa, a big part of the culture in South Africa, sadly, it's a rape culture. Many, many, many people are raped. And she said, through the healing that I've experienced in my life, the Lord is now, by his grace, using me to reach out and help many of these suffering women who are experiencing similar experiences that I went through. So God can bring redemption through our experiences, no matter how traumatic they are, because the law, I am the Lord who healeth thee. That's what he says. And may it be so in our days and in our time. And may we see that in our nation, because we have a nation that are suffering trauma from the prime minister. I believe right from the prime minister, right down, we're going to need something very special. And while, and let me lastly finish, there's a beautiful verse. <clears throat> Uh, where is it? I think it's in Isaiah chapter 30. It says, in that day, the sun, no, it says, in that day, the moon will shine as the sun, and the sun shall shine seven times brighter as the brightness of seven days when the Lord binds up the wound of his people and heal the afflictions that he has caused. That is an incredible picture of God bringing about healing in his land to his people. Amen. Thank you. Wow. What an amazing Parsha and the timing that we would be studying this um, is not a coincidence at all. And mm. I just feel like God you know, really didn't answer these things on purpose so that we would discuss them. And I know a lot of people probably have a lot to say. Um, I just was noticing that back here on page in the beginning, when it, it, it called out that Dina was the daughter born from Leah. And I thought that was interesting. Um, 
And I know women were not necessarily prized, you know, in that day. Um, we don't hear a lot about her. There was no big celebration. Oh, finally a girl, you know, it might've even been, oh, a girl. I don't, you know, I don't really know. We don't know. But my question too is, you know, where is Leah, you know, in all this, she doesn't ever say a whole lot, except when it has to do with battling for Jacob's attention. Um, so that's kind of curious and then um as far as their retribution you know there's anger and then there's a unfair restitution and so it just like that was the first thing I was going to ask you before I even saw your notes is why so extreme like the punishment did not fit the crime in our hearts it may but you know in a judicial system and the rabbis are very much into an eye for an eye and the punishment fitting the crime and all that. You know, why did the so-called innocent people get slain, you know, when it was just the son that committed, you know, the crime? Did they just freak out in their anger? Is is that the lesson that, you know, to keep our anger in check? And good question. Chris, you you've got something? I I was just thinking that sometimes God wanted to destroy the evil that had permeated through all of the people in the land. There was an evil in the in the inherent in the culture, whether you would say it was a demonic thing. Yes, very possibly a demonic thing. God often called for the destruction of all of the people, which makes no sense. Destroy all the people, young and old. Destroy even the, the animals, the cattle, everything. You're destroying the evil and the remembrance of evil from the land. Now, I have a question. The sons of Benjamin, were they also forbidden to take wives from the, from the daughters of Israel because of the concubine that was raped to death and also cut up and dismembered. And then her body was sent all over Israel. Do I have that story right? Yes, I think you, you do. And I think did the answer- Did that precede this or did that come after? Cause that I don't remember. That came after. So yes. where does that, in, the where does that fit in after. with the Benjamin, the son of my sorrow and then so how does that fit that part of the story? Are we just looking at a man who just did evil? Uh, I, I don't understand the question, Chris, sorry. Oh, okay. So Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin was punished because of the evil of one man who allowed his concubine to be raped to death and then dismembered her. And the reaction was, this has not been seen it, throughout all of Israel. This has never been seen before. But the punishment fell on the tribe of Benjamin. The other the tribes, tribe. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how the does tribe, how does, the how tribe does of this, Benjamin defended the rapists, and the tribe of Benjamin acted in disobedience to God's commandment and God's law. So it's about disobedience, total disobedience to God. God is a God of order, and there was an order of things. And when such a horrific thing happens, then you go to the elders, and then you go to the leaders, and then you deal with it. You don't just take matters into your own hands. And um, each party in that story is guilty of taking matters into their own hands and not following mm. the law. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Did that answer your question, Chris? Yes. And it goes back even farther where people take things into their own hands, like Abraham produced an Ishmael, right? The, the mother then made Jacob. She knew the... the uh, she knew Jacob was going to be the have the honor of the elder brother over Esau, and yet she she put things in motion to make it happen. She <clears throat> is the sin here that they did not rely on God to make this happen, but took matters in their own hands. 
or does God partner with people who do things a certain way? There's so many questions in my mind. It also says that Dina went out to visit the women of the land and she was an only girl, you know, and God made mention of that. That was her intent. You know, it didn't say she went out to pick up men in the land. You know, she right. maybe she just wanted some female companionship. Now, maybe it wasn't with the right people, like you said, Chris, but there must have been a few uh, women around the uh, their own camp that they, she could hang out with. They didn't have to go to some foreign area. In fact, I think it says that there that Jacob had other had daughters too, because he keeps saying the daughters and the, and the sons can work, you know, work together when he talked to. Check them. The word daughters was in there. They don't tell us a lot. No. <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> so many questions. And why so, and did I, you I, still I, have I, to I, die then? Like, that's the saddest part, I think. I, I mean, the rape is horrific. But then... I always get so sad when Rachel, like she wanted children so bad. And then she has her second and dies in childbirth. Remember Rachel gave, didn't give her heart to God. Remember Rachel stole the idols in Laban's house and she actually took the idols fully intending to have her secret little worship temple with those idols fully intending to put them up putting her trust in idols i mean women even nowadays will find some idol and put it under their pillow and uh i mean we the kids are taught to put a tooth and the tooth fairy will come and there's you know rachel was guilty of that she was guilty of gross unbelief and gross disobedience to god and it comes down to that. When there's such severe disobedience, there has to be punishment. Um, Yeshua hadn't come at that stage. He didn't atone for our sins. And our sins needed to be paid for. But God in his infinite mercy towards her did not kill her right then and there. He should have. She's worshiping idols. The punishment for that is death. But God did not kill her. And God did allow her to have children. And yeah, it's sad that she died at childbirth of her second child and broke Jacob's heart, but. See, she I thought she get... took those idols so her father wouldn't use them to find her. I didn't know she was an idol worshiper. Yeah, the thing is, too, um, before Jacob goes to Bethel, he t says, get rid of all the idols in the camp. Well, what's the idol still doing in the camp? You think he, he the whole plan would be completely loyal to Al, Al and not just I had a thought you know. on that too because in in 35 as it says Hal that you know God said to get rid of the foreign gods that are among you it's and I it. I was thinking maybe um, that's why Jacob was so silent he was like we we have these foreign gods here, and this is this awful thing has now happened. What do uh, I do? So that may be part of the punishment of Dina, you know that, you know because they had the foreign gods, and she looked to the people who had worshipped the foreign gods. You know, it's, I thought that was interesting where it said the next thing that he was to get rid of the foreign gods that were among them. Yeah. As Israel has now. And I had another thought about, I thought that was very interesting about the, yeah. the Benjamin, the first name, Benoni and Benjamin that it referred to Yeshua as the son of sorrows and then the, the son, son seated at the right hand. I'd never had heard that or, or you know, had um, been taught that before. So that is very interesting. 
and then it made me think of Benjamin Netanyahu, whose name is ben Benjamin. And I had a thought, I don't know, last week or so about maybe a way to um, to talk to Jewish people about Yeshua in that with the hostages, what if Benjamin Netanyahu would say, for all the hostages you can have in exchange, you can have me. I will go. I, you can, you know, Hamas, you can have me because who would they want? They'd want a big leader. And you can, it, what if you would ask a Jewish person, what about that? What about the exchange of Benjamin Netanyahu would say, here, you can have me in exchange for all of the other hostages. People would go, wait. And you could go, that's what Jesus did. He took the place of the hostages of us in bondage. He took our place. It would be a similar example. I mean, not that Benjamin Netanyahu was Jesus, but it's a, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think it, it would be an incredible gesture for Netanyahu to do that. But I, I don't think a lot of Israelis would see it as a, uh, as loss. a, as a loss. Yeah, that's putting it nicely, oh. uh, Yaron. I think they would say, good riddance. Yeah. Or somebody like him, you know, in that in that type of position. But well, actually, you know, it's interesting you 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 say that because I've I saw one lady being interviewed. <clears throat> um, and she was weak and saying words to that effect. She was saying, mm -hmm. take me, just bring my door, take me. So, yeah, yeah there is that sense of sentiment uh, out there. So it can be used to maybe bring people to Christ. That this is what yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great uh, ex example for sure. Others, I'm sure, incentivize the uh, the troops to go after Hamas even stronger when they find out what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, everyone, just on the on the issue, because I, I think I don't know why it really touched me this this um, passage because I don't know if you know someone out there who you know maybe someone close to you whose behavior at times is irrational, even what people call bipolar. Sometimes it's like, why Why are they like that? You know, they're godly, they love the Lord. Uh, one minute, they're totally fine. And then the next minute, they're just like a different person. Um, I'm not saying this is the case, but in some cases, it can be just deep, unhealed hurts or, or deep trauma that people, you know, maybe they, to some level, they have had prayer for, they've had counseling, but, you know, sometimes it needs something deeper, you know, something clinical, because when, and especially when it comes to things like rape, um, uh, or even what do you call it, PT, post-traumatic syndrome, or whatever you call it, disorder. PTSD. Uh, exactly. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it needs something deeper. Uh, of course, the, the scriptures say the arm of the Lord is not too short that it cannot say. But, um, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's almost impossible it, it, to us that these people, they don't change uh, because of deep, unhealed hurts. And it can be very frustrating knowing them, living with them. And especially when you see them, they some days they're wonderful. They love the Lord. But uh, then the, 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 those deep inner unhealed hurts keep resurfacing. It's very frustrating. Um, but with God, there's always hope. And with prayer. And of course, um, you know, hopefully with the willingness of the people um to to recognize that they have an issue that's a key thing and then once they recognize you can fly benny hin over and have him pray over your particular somebody whoever 
in the group and uh, and all is yep. good. Amen. Yep, but only if you pay him. <laughs> That's very naughty. I know. Naughty. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> It's um, human beings are the most amazing thing ever. And um, part of our plague is the demonic and it's very seductive. And just like Yeshua himself, Abba was plagued by the king of demons and um, had to toss him out chuck him out of heaven when we as believers get plagued by demonic things we do have to recognize and we do need to toss it out um, are we good at doing that oh some demons took me years because it was fun to have that certain pain from my period of serving in special forces um Various events that happened during those three years and three months, various thoughts I entertained when I was completely, completely by myself inside of enemy territory, deep in an Arab country. Um, so it's the best is to toss them out. And yeah, we often need each other's help to toss things out because we're just humans amen yes amen, amen. Do, we have, do we have time to help me with a a very difficult problem regarding obedience and disobedience to the law um i am a friend of a young man in his 30s who appears to have been damaged either by a COVID vaccine or has um, long COVID. And he's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. He cannot, well, he can hardly stand. He has to have four or five naps a day. He's a believer. He comes from a family of believers. He has a healing ministry and all these good things. But he did tell me once that he has contempt for his father. So we're now in contravention of commandment five. He demanded that his his mother leave the home because her behavior was impossible. So now he has split husband and wife. Let no man put them asunder. Mm. The father actually went in pursuit of his wife who had gone home to Finland, where she comes from. And the son felt that dad should sort mum out before bringing her back but no, nothing had changed. So I see this young man as being doubly cursed because first of all, he has knowingly flouted God's command to honor his father and mother. And also he has put us asunder a husband and wife. Okay, briefly, but he did it. He very high handedly did it. Um, and I, he's now been granted um, a huge sum of money to go to travel to California uh, to undergo hyperbaric oxygen therapy to heal his damage caused by COVID. I think the whole expedition will fail because he's actually fallen into the hands of the living God. Well, what's his name, Jane? Matt. Matt. Yeah. What do you suggest, Edie? That we pray for Matt. That would be great. You're right. We we can pray for Matt. And the Lord said he did not come to judge, but he did come to set free. So we can pray for Matt. Um, that the Lord did not come to judge. The Lord did come to set Matt free and everyone else involved in Matt's life. And um, the Lord should open Matt's heart and give him a revelation about what is his responsibility in life. And um, his responsibility is to pray and submit to his parents. And so 
God willing, it will all be sorted out. And yeah, we do need to keep him in prayer. I'd be grateful. I'm his prayer grandma. All right. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yaron, could you please lift him up in prayer right now while we're on the... Thank you. אבא שבשמיים, אנחנו מודים לך על החיים של מת, אבא, אנחנו מודים לך שאתה שולט, ואבא, אתה יכול להוציא אותו מכל השטויות. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. <coughs> we ask you, Abba, to... You do not intervene without a request. So we request, Abba, Father. We come and stand in the gap for Matt, Abba, Father. We stand in the gap for him. He might not be asking you, Abba, to interfere and do an intervention in his life. But Abba, because we are here with his prayer grandmother, his spiritual grandmother, we ask you by that authority that you have given her in the spirit realm over her, that Abba, you just touch that young man, touch Matt, Abba, Father, free him. from the bondage of thinking he is the head, he is responsible. Give him back his humility, his ability to listen to your word, Abba Father, his ability to influence his parents and his surroundings in prayer, Abba Father, and not in pride of, I know what to do, you're wrong, get out of here, go to Finland. That's not the way you work, Abba Father. So Abba Father, we ask you today, that you really touch Matt's heart. Abba Father, we seek his good, and we seek the entire family's good, Abba Father. And we know that Yeshua died on the cross for all of us, and we know that he died so that we will be set free. So Abba Father, we ask you to set Matt free, and we command whatever diabolical entities, demons, etc., have attached themselves to Matt's life, whether it be through pride or any other reason or any roots or any gateways open in the past through other ancestors or anything. Abba, Father, we ask you to close all those doors, all demonic doors, all demonic coverages, all demonic penetrations. Abba, Father, we ask you to close those doors. Abba, Father, You say, rebuke the devil and he will flee. So we stand in unity with Jane rebuking the devil off of Matt and calling on you, Abba Father, to free him and bless him in Yeshua's mighty name. Heal him, Abba Father, from any long COVID effects in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. And Amen. Lord, I pray also for your release of his mother, I feel she has a coercive spirit. And in the name of Jesus, I command that spirit to leave. Holy Spirit, bring peace to the family. Bring peace between husband and wife, respect and honor. Bless the children who are disturbed by the trauma between husband and wife. Thank you, Lord, that you love this family. Thank you for all the good they do in your name. Thank you that you are the one who brings freedom. Amen. Thank you so much, dear friends. Yes, you're welcome. welcome. Thank you for sharing that with us. And um, thank you for your prayer, Yaron. Um, Gary, do you have anything to share before we close in prayer? Yes, sir. We love you, Jane. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, Aaron, you did a great study. Thank you so much for your study, brother. Can't believe you did 19 pages in only an hour and a half. Amazing. Sorry, uh, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> uh, actually, it was, actually, it was 18 pages. Um, 18 is life, brother. So uh, I was gonna, as a close, I was going to say, Um, after Rachel dies, giving birth to her second son, whose name is changed from Benoni to Benjamin, Jacob returns to his father, Isaac, 
who lives, an old, who lives to be an old age of 180, but Jacob never sees his mother again since she died while he was away uh, in Haran. So Jacob's life shows us that we may go through many trials and difficulties, but through tenacity and prayer, we can, we can be overcomers. I believe we can overcome anything through prayer, through tenacity, um, and uh, that's a good word for you as well, Jade. Um, Yeshua told us that in this life, we will have many, many troubles. But we can be of good cheer, for he, for he has overcome yeah. the world in John 16, 33. So to this very day, the descendants of Jacob, Israel, will struggle, still struggle with the divine man, God in the flesh, Yeshua HaMashiach. And that's why we need to pray for all Israel to be saved. And that was, that was, that was, that was just my, my part. Man. Thank you. Amen. 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 Good word. Amen. Great. Dini, you're silenced. You're muted. If you want to close us in prayer. Yes. And I do have a stop recording thing. It's somewhere else, but I'm going to restart my computer when we get done. So it's going to ask you for a code. Okay. Because a lot of people are asking on the Zoom community where the record button went. So maybe they did an update or something. I don't know why you have it and I don't. It's so. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fine. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Minister to us. And Lord, where we have grief, where we have pain, where we have trauma. <sighs> unhealed hurts lord i pray that you would that would be our testimony we would go from benoni to benjamin that you would heal our broken hearts and lord use us to be ministers of reconciliation in this world thank you that you've reconciled us through the blood of yeshua the blood of your son the one who came and uh, purchased our redemption. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Gary. Amen. If you can all please unmute and receive the blessing of the Lord, please. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his guns upon each and every one of you and fill it overflowing with his peace, with his shalom. Hashem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. Adonai our Lord. Moshienu our Redeemer. Tell you it's mighty God. Um, uh, everlasting Father. Aviad. Our everlasting Father, Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, El Gibor, Mighty God, Avino Mokenu, our Father, our King, Ari Yehuda, Lion of Judah, our El Shaddai, our All Sufficient God, and all of God's people says, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gary, that was the first time I've heard you stumble on that prayer. I know, right? I know that. I don't know what happened.